All right, good morning. If you guys would uh, open up to Matthew chapter 5, and you should have a set of notes in front of you that are titled Lesson 44, Jot and Tittle Preservation, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. So um, I do want to start, though, by, going, by just reviewing some things that we went over last Sunday. Last Sunday, Sunday, I introduced you to this chart for the first time, and we photocopied it. And hopefully everybody was sent home with a copy of this chart. And what this chart presents to you is what I am considering a scriptural model for dealing with textual variants. Okay? And so the, the chart style starts out up here with uh, the understanding that uh, verbal plenary, plenary verbal inspiration and the promise of preservation are both taught by the scriptures and one maintains a belief in inspiration and preservation because of the scripture. Then we looked at the idea of preservation as the corollary of inspiration and we saw that uh, some take this corollary too far and the false assumption that preservation requires verbatim identicality of wording has led to uh, some unfortunate positions. One encounters and needs to exercise caution with respect to preservation when they deal with the issue of variant readings. We talked about the fact that they're a historical fact. No two Byzantine manuscripts, editions of the text of Receptus, or King James editions are exactly the same. This ought to lead you then to the conclusion that preservation did not occur with identical wording. And so from there we talked about the originals only option and how they're trying to confine all that stuff to the originals only. Then we talked about the faith for faith sakes option and the idea that preservation was plenary verbal with the same, uh, exactly the same as it was uh, with inspiration. And then we talked about a biblically amended position that, and I'm going to read this to you, it says the facts need not overthrow one's belief in the promise of preservation. Rather, one looks back to the scriptures which taught them to believe in preservation in the first place to learn how to think about variant readings. When one does this, they will conclude that the insistence upon the standard of verbatim identicality was excessive and an overstatement of what the scriptures teach about preservation. So you look back here, you look at what the scripture, the same scriptures have taught you to believe in uh, preservation and inspiration, and you look to them to instruct you about how to think about variant readings. And what I suggested to you over the last two lessons is that what you need to do is drop verbatim identicality as a standard for preservation. And if one allows the King James Bible to teach them about the nature of preservation, they will conclude that demanding verbatim identicality as a standard for preservation was overreaching to begin with. There are at least four scriptural proofs found in the King James Bible to support this conclusion. Those were, again, how the Old Testament quotes the Old Testament, how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, how the New Testament quotes the New Testament, and then that lengthy comparison between 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37. By observing these realities allows one to maintain their belief in the promise of preservation without overstating the facts. This biblically revised position can still be maintained by faith in God's word without abandoning the fadistic or believing approach to scripture. So that's kind of what we went over last time. If you go to the notes... Last week in Lesson 42, I demonstrated using Scripture, demanding I verbatim identicality as a standard for preservation, was overreaching and not supported by the biblical data. Based upon the textual facts observed in Lesson 42, we concluded that it would be wrong to require verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation. This standard cannot even be sustained within the King James text. Consequently, it is not helpful or productive for King James advocates to adopt a standard for preservation that cannot even be sustained in the very Bible they are asserting is perfect. In addition, uh, Lesson 42, that should say Lesson 43, in addition, Lesson 43 demonstrated that, uh, that the testimony of Scripture does not require verbatim phraseology, but simply equivalent meaning. It is possible to say the exact same thing using different words. And I gave you these two illustrations last week. At 3.30, I drove to the store. I drove to the store at half past three. Are they saying the exact same thing? Are they doing it with identical wording? No. And then I gave you the example of 2 Timothy 2.15. The, the end of that verse in the Geneva Bible says, dividing the word of truth aright. And the King James reads, rightly dividing the word of truth. Again, do they mean the same thing? Yes. Are they using identical wording? No. 
So the following four proofs that Scripture approves of substantive equivalence and does not require verbatim identicality were offered in lesson, I should say, 43 again. So it'll be a lesson 43. And again, those are the fact that the New Testament quotes of the that the New Testament quotes of the Old Testament did not match verbatim, the fact that Old Testament quotations of the Old Testament did not match verbatim, the fact that New Testament quotations of the New Testament do not match verbatim, and then the comparison between 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37 did not match verbatim. So if you recall from last week, our comparison of 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37 within the King James Bible produced the following baseline data. Remember, I'm not claiming that these statistics are infallible, okay? I literally went cross-eyed trying to count this stuff. I'm certain I've miscounted something, but at a minimum, we saw that there are only two verses there that were completely identical. We saw two different prepositions, four different punctuations, four cases where singular and plural can both be correct, nine different words and phraseologies, 12 different spellings, 15 different verse divisions, and 35 different phrasings. So all that is review from last Sunday. Okay. The lack of identicality in both phraseology and punctuation exhibited by this comparison calls into question how King James advocates have traditionally understood Christ's statement in Matthew 5, 17 and 18. So let's read that. Matthew 5, 17. This is in the Sermon on the Mount here. Christ says in verse 17, He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay? So the goal of this lesson is to consider the meaning of Matthew 5.17 in light of the textual and historical facts. So in order to accomplish this purpose, we're going to consider the following points. Okay? Point number one. We want to look at the use of Matthew 5.17 by King James only advocates. And then we want to look secondly next week, which it's going to be next week, it's not going to be in this lesson. We want to look at the use of Matthew 5.17 by those critical of the King James only position. So we're going to look at both what both sides have had to say about this verse. Okay, we're going to look at what the King James only side has said about it this morning. And then next week, we're going to look at what the, uh, those who have been critical of the King James only position have said about Matthew uh, 5, 17, and 18. So, is everybody understanding kind of where we're going with this? All right. So, let's look at the main topic then for today, which is the, how the verse has been used by King James only advocates. Many King James only advocates have used Matthew 5, 17 and 18 as a proof text for their belief that preservation occurred with exact identicality. Okay? Now let's, let's look at the verses again. Verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be what? Now, on the surface, can you what is how is this verse going to be used? This verse is going to be used to say that not even the smallest letter or punctuation is going to even the smallest letter and punctuation is going to be preserved with complete what? With complete identicality till everything in the law is fulfilled. Okay? Now, let me just say this also if you look at the next sentence there. In, in the past, I myself have used this verse to make the argument for, for verbatim identicality. I've used this verse to say that preservation happens exactly identical to what was given under inspiration. That the King James Bible, for example, is a, com is a complete 100% to the jot, tittle, and iota reproduction of the original text with complete verbatim identicality. I have used these verses in the past myself to make that kind of assertion. Okay, Gary 
C. Webb's chapter titled, Not One Jot or One Tittle, Matthew 5, 17 and 18, and Thou Shalt Keep Them, A Biblical Theology of the Perfect Preservation of Scripture, stands out as a case in point of this thinking. Okay? In the introduction, Webb argues that Matthew 5, 17 and 18 establishes the doctrine of verbal plenary preservation or the preservation of the precise wording of the text of Scripture. Now when he says that, what does he mean? He means exactly what? Exactly verbatim, exactly the same. Okay? So let's look what he says. He states, quote, The precise wording of the text of Scripture provides the authority of the inspired inerrant word. When one combines Jesus' promise that one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, with his assertion that spiritual greatness belongs to those who keep the least commandments, his statements demand a doctrine of verbal and plenary preservation of the text of Scripture. So, there, there is a King James advocate saying it. You needed to see in writing somebody basically saying that, right? That, that preservation, that the, that the corollary, the connection between inspiration and preservation therefore means that preservation demands the standard of exact what? Of exact verbatim identicality and wording. Okay? In the section titled the apologetic assertion of Matthew 5, 17 through 20, Webb identifies the jot and tittle as follows. He says, quote, Jesus continued his defense with a solemn statement of the plenary infallibility of the law. He identified the authority of the smallest portion of the Old Testament by referring to the smallest portions of the Hebrew text itself. The jot refers to the smallest Hebrew consonant. Modern scholars normally define the tittle as only referring to a bend or point in the actual Hebrew letters themselves. Okay? Jesus asserted that no portion of the teaching of the Old Testament would pass out of existence, lose its authority, or be annulled until every bit had its fulfillment. Indeed, he declared that such an occurrence is an absolute impossibility. So, Webb, what Webb is saying here is that down to the most minutest detail of written language, the jots and the tittles, they were going to be preserved identically to the way that they were written, okay, under what? Inspiration. Under inspiration. Okay. When he's talking about plenary verbal preservation, he literally means every punctuation mark, every pen stroke, everything would be exactly what? Preserved. Okay? So, we'll go to the next point. If Webb, worked, if Webb would have stopped here, so I kind of have said a little, I've kind of gotten a little bit ahead of myself, but if he would have stopped in just that statement there in that quote, I'd be inclined to agree with him. Jesus is saying that no detail of the law is going to go unfulfilled. I mean, look at what he just said. He said, Jesus asserted that no portion of the Old Testament teaching would pass out of existence, lose its authority, or be annulled until every bit of it had been fulfilled. I, I believe that. Okay? If he would have stopped there, I, would, I wouldn't have an issue with it. But the problem is he doesn't stop there, he carries it further than that. Okay, so let's go back to the point. If Webb would have stopped here, I would, have be, I would be inclined to agree with him. Jesus is saying is that no detail of the law is going to go unfulfilled. That being said, Webb certainly does not stop there. He goes on to argue that Matthew 5, 17 and 18 means that even the jots and the tittles would be preserved with exact identicality to what was given under inspiration. The application of the passage on the textual debate, the demand for verbal preservation of the text of Scripture, comprises one, comprises one of the major sections of Webb's essay. In this section, Webb clearly equates <clears throat> verbal preservation with exact identicality of wording as the standard for preservation. He says, quote, could the changing of one letter in the Hebrew or Greek text change a word and thereby affect the meaning of a doctrine or command? Could. Could? Yeah. Depending, depending on what is changed and how it's what? 
changed. Okay? Certainly it could and usually does. Now, look, now follow the scenario that he gives to try to illustrate this. He's going to give you a hypothetical. He says here, what if a Christian facing severe repercussions can you get the door please Lolly? facing severe repercussions uh, struggles with the issue of complete honesty in a certain situation the day of importance arrives and he rises early to meet his God his soul agonizes as he opens his New American Standard Version of the Bible to the seventh chapter of John's Gospel to the place assigned by his daily reading schedule. In that passage, he reads that Jesus lied to his brothers, saying that he would not go to the feast in verse 8, when in fact, when in fact verse 10 says, he did go up later. Suppose you read this about Jesus. He nevertheless believes... Uh, he has his answer from God. A proper interpretation of the text tells him that he can lie in some circumstances. The proper interpretation would also nullify the sinlessness of Christ and render him incapable of accomplishing our redemption. Okay, there's a lot to unweave there. So look at so in this example, Webb is referring to the fact. So everybody turn to John seven. Everybody turn to John 7. You got to really pay attention to this stuff, folks. So John 7. So, in this example, Webb is referring to the fact that the New American Standard Version follows the critical text in John 7, 8 by omitting the word yet as it reads in the Texas Receptus and the King James Bible. So look at your Bible and then look, I've provided for you in the notes the New American Standard Version, John 7, 8. Okay? The King James says, Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up what? Yeah. Yet. Until this, uh, I go up not yet. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Now look at the New American Standard. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully what? So what word is missing from the New American Standard? Yeah. Yet. Why is the word yet missing from the New American Standard? It's missing from the New American Standard because the critical text that the New American Standard is translating doesn't have that Greek word in the text. Why does the word yet appear in your King James Bible? Because the Texas Receptus that the King James Bible translators are translating has that corresponding word in the what? In the text. Okay. Now, here's the problem though. The problem in verse 8 resides in the fact that in verse 10, in both versions, Jesus goes up to the feast. Okay? In verse 10, two verses later, John 7.10, the King James says, But when his brethren were gone up, then he went up also unto the feast, not openly, but as it were, in what? Secret. In secret. John 7.10 in the New American Standard. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in what? In secret. So you see the, the, you see the problem here, right? In the New American Standard in verse 8, when it, when it, and, and the critical text, when it removes the word yet, it has Jesus saying, I'm not going to go, and then two verses later, he what? He goes. The King James and the Text of Septus have him saying, I'm not going to go what? Yet, until, uh, until my time, uh, for my time is not yet come, and then two verses later, he what? He goes up. So this is the example that Webb is using. Okay? Now, look, go top page four. <coughs> so notice carefully what's going on here. Webb has correctly identified that the New American Standards reading in John 7, 8 creates a problem with verse 10 by its dropping of the word yet. That being said, why is the problem created? Here's where you've got to really think about this, okay? Because they are not identical in their wording or because they differ substantively. 
When you drop the word yet out of there, does it substantively alter what verse 8 is telling you? Yes. But he's using this as a verse to argue for verbatim identicality of what? Wording, when he himself is not even what? That's really not what his problem is. His real problem here is not necessarily verbatim identicality. His real problem is here is that the change has creates a substantive what? Difference and problem. Okay? So because they are not identical in their wording or because they differ substantively, it is because they differ substantively, i.e. the critical text omission of the word yet creates a textual difficulty within John 7 for the New American Standard. But more than that, it asserts something that is opposite from the King James and the Textus Receptus. In other words, both readings cannot be factually correct because they teach opposites. Therefore, Webb's example does not prove what he is arguing for, namely that every jot and tittle must be preserved with verbatim identicality. Rather, it proves that preservation excludes substantive differences in meaning. Does everybody, see what I'm, does everybody see what I'm saying there? Okay. So he's using the verse to argue for one thing without realizing that that's not really what he's what? That's not really what he's arguing for. Okay. So you go to the next point. According to Webb, a reading must, a reading must have exact precision in order to be considered the Word of God. One wonders what Webb would say about the following pre- King James English translations of the TR. The Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible both contain the word yet in John 5, 7, 8, but are not, ident are not exactly identical in the totality of their wording. Yet, do they, yet they do not differ from each other substantively. In other words, they are substantively equivalent without being exactly what? Identical. identical. So look at the Geneva Bible. Now, so now you really get to see how the language changes here, right? The Geneva Bible says, Go ye up unto this feast. I will not go up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet what? Fulfilled. Fulfilled. The bishop said, Go ye up unto this feast. I will not go up. I will not go up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full what? Come, King James, go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Does if in that verse, in John 7, 8, do the Geneva, the bishops, and the King James all say the same thing? Are they all are they substantively equivalent with each other? Do they have verbatim identicality of wording? No. So what Webb is really, well I'm getting ahead of myself, Webb clearly argues for the preservation of the exact wording as his standard for preservation based upon Matthew 5, 17 and 18. <coughs> he says, quote, but as the Lord indicated the authority and validity of the least command or any command in Scripture depends upon the exact wording of that command in the scriptural text. Jesus immediately states man's obligation to obey and teach all the commands, even the least of them, which demands that we must have the very jots and tittles that express those what? Now, what is he saying there? He's saying if it's not exactly verbatim, then it's what? It's incapable of expressing the command uh, appropriately. Later in this section, Webb provides an example of doubling down on verbal preservation for faith's sake. So what you're going to see here is an example of this position right here, option number two. Okay, notice what he does. Some scholars and textual critics mock this clear, unbiased, derived doctrine of verbal preservation claiming that the evidence of copies containing errors refutes the Bible doctrine. So Wallace and Glennie would be a case in point here. Okay? Then he quotes Romans 3. Go over to Romans 3. I just didn't reproduce it for you because I figured we could just read it. Romans 
Romans 3, verse 3. It says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest, and mightest overcome <clears throat> when thou art judged. Okay? So that's, that's what he has in mind. So let's go back to the quote in the notes. Should say some scholars, not scholar, Sylvia, there needs to be an S there. Some scholars and textual critics mock this clear, unbiased, derived doctrine of verbal preservation, claiming that the evidence of copies containing errors refutes the Bible doctrine. So, why, why are some arguing that there's no promise of preservation? Because of textual what? Differences. Differences. Textual variance. Okay? Then he quotes this verse, these two verses here from Romans chapter 3, Webb does, and then we'll look at what he says. He says, the evidence claimed by evolutionists, uh, by evolutionists, I think that should have an S there, I need to check that too, by evolutionists does not cause the believer to give up the Bible doctrine of creation. Why? Because he knows that the evolutionist humanistic presuppositions have caused him to view and judge the evidence wrongly. Likewise, the scholar who follows the humanistic precepts of modern textual criticism makes the same type of error, judging the evidence with rationalistic presuppositions rather than by those in Scripture. Okay? Now, top page five. Hang on a second. While I agree with Webb concerning the rationalistic presuppositions of modern textual criticism, his answer is simply to double down on faith for faith's sake in his understanding of verbal preservation. So these guys, if they would just believe, they would see it. If Wallace and Glennie just had enough faith and they just believed, they would see that they're what? wrong and they would do so by faith. Okay. In the meantime, he hasn't even come close to addressing the reality that there are what? Differences. That there are variants in this thing that need to somehow be dealt with and figured out. Okay. On page 57 in footnote 59, Webb quotes from Samuel Sh uh, Sh Schneider's Schneider? Schneider. Schneider's textual criticism and the modern English version controversy in Biblical Viewpoint from 1982. In this quote, Schneider states the following regarding Wilbur Pickering's view of preservation. Quote, he says, Pickering shows that he has fallen into error of equating inspiration with preservation as described above. He also demonstrates that his view of the authority of God's Word depends on the, now watch, depends on the recovery of the original wording of the New Testament text. And if it is true that his concept of authority is dependent on the preservation of precise what? Wordings. Then it, is, then it is scarcely conceivable that even such a scholar as he has arrived at his conclusions from the evidence as much as from his what? What is he saying? He's saying he was biased. He's saying that Pickering did not come to this conclusion through, a, through an honest evaluation of the evidence. He came to it through a pre, presupposition. That preservation had to had to equate what identical. identical wording. Is everybody following that? Okay. Knowledge, knowledge that Pickering's concept of authority depends upon preservation of precise wordings brings into question his entire what procedure. procedure. Now look at what's going on here. The guys in this group are criticizing the guys in this group and saying, these guys are making rationalistic presuppositions. The guys in this group are criticizing the guys in this group saying, these guys are making rationalistic presuppositions. They are. Yes. Because they're dealing with the evidence in one way that I think is unbiblical, and these guys are dealing with the evidence in a different way that is that equally is what? 
unbiblical. Uh-oh. Does everybody see what I'm saying? So the solution to the conundrum is not in either one of these positions. It's in a revised one. It's in a revised position. Does everybody see how one side saying you're making pre you're making rationalistic presuppositions? You're making rationalistic presuppositions. And they're doing what? They're talking past each other. They're not really even dealing with the core issue. But how much ink has been spilled arguing about this? Okay? Now, where, at, where was I at? Am I at just as modern? Yes. Okay. <coughs> just as modern textual criticism has built has been built upon a set of rationalistic presuppositions, Schneider is pointing out that the plenary verbal position on preser uh, the plenary verbal position, meaning on preservation, has as well. No one arguing for the preservation of the precise wording can point to which manuscript, TR edition, or edition of the King James got everything exactly correct. Is everybody with that? Therefore, this position suffers from the predisposition or presupposition that preservation demands verbatim identicality of wording. Here's the thing. Ruckman knew this. He knew it. I believe he knew it. Okay, he knew it. But instead of looking back to the Bible to inform his beliefs on the nature of preservation, he solves the conundrum. He argues that the King James translators were inspired in the same sense as the biblical writers as a means of providing the identicality of wording demanded by this position. That's what he did. If you study the literature on this, what this the literature on this, the early literature starts out as a textual debate between what is the, what is the most, rap, what is the most uh, reliable representation of the original text, the TR, the critical text, okay? And as this thing matriculates through the 1970s and comes out the other side in the 1980s, it comes out not as an issue of the TR, now it comes out as an issue of what? The translation itself. All right? Now we'll talk about the New King James in due course, but the the proponents, in, in, in a way, these guys had their bluff called when the New King James Bible was introduced in 1982, because the New King James Bible was largely based on what text? The text of Receptus. And if they're going to argue that, well, the text of Receptus is really the best text, then it would have followed that they should have accepted what? the New King James Version. Now I think there are some readings in the New King James that are suspect, but I'm not going to get into all that today. But the point is, it, it moved from being a textual issue now to being an issue of what? Translation. Because now we've got to defend exactly verbatim every jot and tittle that's in that King James Bible as an absolutely perfect, exactly precise, verbatim, in English, rendering of the original what? Of the original Greek. Is everybody following that? So, but here's the thing. Ruckman didn't start out arguing that. He started arguing for this in the early 70s. But if you study, if, if, you, if you take his books and you lay them out on the table and you study them in order, he changes his view. Now why did he do that? And so he has to do it because he is ultimately arguing that the, that the standard for this has to be what? James. Verbatim identicality. Yes, Brother Dibble. So, so yeah, but what's one that he says inspired? The 1611? So then he's got a problem there. Well, that's, that's my point. But yes, so his problem doesn't go away. So the way they deal with, so the way they deal with that problem so then, then it became, so once they, once they fall on this, then the critics will then say, well, which edition? 
right? And so then the answer is, well, the only differences in the additions between 1611 and 1769 are spelling, <coughs> punctuation, and three, correction of printer errors. Okay? The problem is, if you study the textual history of the King James Bible, guess what you find out? There's more differences between the different editions than simply spelling, punctuation, and correction of what? Printer errors. I've already showed you one where the word both is in Jude 25 in the 1769 text, but it's not in what? The 1611 text. So if it has to be precise, verbatim, every, every jot and tittle, how do you explain this whole other word that's in it that's not in the other one? So do you see how they have... Bat you see how through their own... These guys here, I think they have backed themselves into a corner through the use of their rationalistic explanations. These guys have done the exact same thing. These guys accuse these guys of being rationalistic. These guys accuse these guys of being what? Rationalistic. The, the major difference between this position and this position is this one at least starts out saying that, listen, you've got to have faith that God preserved His Word. But then what they do is they carry the corollary what? Too far. So this position is marginally better than this position, but it's still not what? It's still not correct. Okay, so let's go back to the notes. Watch how Webb doubles down on his own position in footnote 59 following the above quotation from, what do we say his name was? Schneider. Schneider. Webb states the following in response. He says, quote, How could a Christian who professes to believe in verbal inspiration make such a statement? Verbal inspiration guarantees precise wordings, which are the basis for every Christian doctrine. If we do not have precise wordings, we do not have we do not have the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Oh, do you see what he's doing? He's doubling down, and by applying the standards of his own doubling down, can he tell us which one had everything precise? That seems to me like that's like kind of just maybe a major problem. Okay? So let me finish the quote. For the Christians, for the Christians, the presupposition of a preserved text of Scripture which, preside, which provides precise wordings should underline our conclusion on the textual bait, just as it did our conclusion on every other issue of faith and practice. Yes, if you don't take it to what? Uh, Too far. Nate? Well, in taking it that way, doesn't he create the same exact problem that he's trying to fight against that we don't know where in the manuscript evidence the Word of God is? Because now he's forced to find it in a version or in an edition or in a printing house edition or whatever. So he's literally backed himself into the same exact corner as his opposition. How does he know that what he has in front of him reproduce precisely the words of the original in the absence of the original? Right. He doesn't know that any more than the other guys know that. And there's no mechanism to ever... And there's no mechanism to ever know for sure. <laughs> so both positions are arguing past each other in a way because of what they're demanding. Okay? So... This is, this is where Webb's fadistic believing approach needs to be biblically adjusted by allowing the Bible to teach him how to think about variant readings. If Webb were honest, he would admit that he cannot sustain this standard within the printed history of the King James Bible, the very Bible he is arguing reproduced the precise words of the original. Okay? Mike, you look like you had a question. Well, I, I just don't see... If you, you have to start somewhere, as you often say, so what's wrong with just saying the TR is... Is, uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying it was wrong. I, because the TR the TR differs substantively from what? Well, all I was saying here was this whole debate started out as a debate about this. 
And as the debate unfolded, and the guys argued back and forth, some of them took it into an issue that it left being an issue for some of them of just the text, and now became an issue of what? This. But, but the new King James Version is based on a, a different text than the TR. The new King James Version is eclectic. Okay, it's taking it's taking readings from here and here. Right. So okay. It's the same so it's not the same. So they could argue for their TR. Right. So let me restate something I said earlier. Then, in the 1980s, after nearly a decade in the 70s of arguing about this, there were some who concluded that the only way they could salvage verbatim identicality was to, was to say that the translation was inspired. There were others who did not go that far, such as Hodges and Pickering and some of those guys. But then there were other guys who, said, who, who realized that based upon the argumentation they were having that it had, and, and the criticism they were receiving from their opponents, they go that extra step and now say that the translation itself was, then the translators themselves were what? Inspired to accomplish and secure that verbatim identity, that precise verbatim wording that their position is mandating. Not all of them did that, some of them did. And even, the, even Pickering and Hodges and those guys, they're, they're, and again, this can get real confusing real fast, so I don't want to do too much. They're going to argue for something anyway called the majority text, which is different, which is slightly different from this, but certainly different from that. Okay, but we'll get into all that later. I just want you to see right now, this side is accusing this side of being rationalistic. This side is accusing this side of being what? rationalistic and neither one of them has really presented a position that I can believe out of a Bible. Okay? So, in conclusion to his essay on Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Dr. Webb writes, in defending himself against the, pos against the possible criticism that he came to destroy the teaching of the Old Testament, Jesus gave Christians an absolute assurance in Matthew 5, 18 through 19 of the verbal and plenary preservation of the text of Scripture. His words demand that Christians concerned about textual criticism return to a position of faith, a position that builds its textual model on the teachings of the Bible. I agree with that. Modern textual criticism has, uh, modern, modern textual criticism does not do this, but ignores or discounts Jesus' exact what? See, now I'm not with, now, I, now he's taking it to what? Is Jesus saying, there is no, we've already looked at it. Jesus says it is written. In the New Testament, right? You go, you go back to the Old Testament, and those exact words that he says there in the New Testament, are they written in the Old Testament exactly verbatim? No. But is it, are they substantively equivalent to each other, and are they communicating the exact same doctrine in the way Jesus quotes the Old Testament? Okay, now, uh, next paragraph. Why then should Christians, whom then should Christians believe? Did God leave the preservation of the texts of Old and New Testament to fallible copyists? Well, unless he's miraculously intervening to overtake the pen of everybody that ever copied the text, is the Godhead allowing for some variation to occur? Did God leave the preservation? Okay, I already read that. Do Christians only have evidence of history to support their doctrine of preservation? Or did Jesus mean what he taught when he said, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus taught that the authority of God's word rested upon the divine preservation of the text. Again, there are individual statements in here that I think he's right about. But then there are other statements where he goes to what? Where he goes too far. Belief in this doctrine leads men today to reject modern textual criticism with its invalid texts and accept the text and the methods that produce them behind the King James Version of the Bible. So, 
Webb is clearly using Matthew 5, 17 and 18 to advance the notion that preservation extends to the very jots and tittles and requires exact identicality. Webb's position is correct in principle regarding the faith approach, but he fails to fully apply his own principle and thereby fails to arrive at a sound and sustainable understanding of preservation. In the end, Webb's essay is an example of option two, faith for faith's sake from the chart in lesson 43. Okay? Now, just a couple other things. We got about 15 minutes. So what I've done here is also just sort of provided for you a sampling of other literature that discusses this. So use of Matthew 5, 17, and 18 in other King James only literature. Webb is certainly not alone in using Matthew 5, 17, and 18 as a proof text for the notion of verbal plenary preservation or the notion that preservation occurred with exact identicality. The following pro-King James authors include the passage in their lists of verses that teach preservation, but offer little direct commentary upon the verse. So they just have the verse included in a list of verses that teach preservation. So some examples are, um, in 1975, David Otis Fuller edited, edited Counterfeit or Genuine, in which he included an essay by Donald Brake which includes a very brief discussion of Matthew 5, 17 and 18. In 1999, Forever Settled, a survey of the documents and history of the Bible. Jack Mormon included the verse in his list of passages that teach preservation. Same with the 2000 work, Crowned with Glory. In 2007, uh, from within the Grace Movement, Terrence McLean, the history of your Bible, proving the King James Bible is the perfectly preserved words of God. He, he includes the verse in his list of verses. In 2003, which, uh, which Bible would Jesus, 2013, excuse me, which Bible would Jesus use? The Bible version controversy explained and resolved. And we need to alter that. That's Jack McElroy as the author there, not Jack Mormon. Jack McElroy. So those authors also include that verse in their list of verses that teach preservation. Uh, the following authors comment more extensively on Matthew 5, 17, and 18. Um, on how Matthew 5, 17, and 18 uh, relates to or establishes the doctrine of preservation. Uh, in the introduction to which Bible in 1970, David Otis Fuller said the following. The power and providence of God are displayed in the history of the preservation and transmission of His Word. The fulfillment of the promise of the Son of God, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Our Lord has not get, was not given to exaggeration, and God's holy law was not confined to the commands of Sinai, but it set forth all that he inspired his prophets and apostles to write. So that's not a real detailed explanation of what the, how the passage relates. He's just sort of using it in a general sense. That is certainly not the case, though, for some of these other folks. So, 2003. In 2003, Gail Ripplinger released this massive book. It's called, In All of Thy Word, Understanding the King James Bible. It's mystery and hidden, it, it's mystery and history, letter by letter. This is, a, this is a book that followed up the 1998 release of the language of the King James Bible, Discover Its Hidden Built-in Dictionary, also by Ripplinger. Okay? Uh, both of these books... So I scanned both of these books looking for references to Matthew 5, 17, and 18. I could not find them directly related, but I did not read every word of this thing trying to find one needle in a haystack. But I did read enough to know that they both demand verbatim identicality as a standard for preservation to the very, Ripplinger says, to the very letter and word order. If there's one letter one word order that's different. It's not the Word of God. It is incapable of expressing the exact sense. Okay? In 2011, in commemoration of the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, 
Ripplinger published a pay, an essay titled Settings of the King James Bible in which she derided non-British spellings in the English Bible. American printings that change the spelling of the word music with a K to music without the K were viewed as in introducing careless errors into the King James Bible. So I ask you, are they carrying this to the very jots and tittles, to the letters themselves, to the word order? If you drop the K, then it's not, it's incapable. Let me read to you what she says here. Page 3, she says, the English Bible is English. Read that again. It's not American. It's English. So if you alter the spelling of a word, it is now rendered incapable. You see how far this is going? Okay. She says in this book from 1998, the King James used the British spelling. And because of the spread of the British Empire, it is still the spelling used throughout the world. Music is spelled music with a K everywhere in the world except the United States. New versions have been joined by some printers of the King James Version, like Zondervan, the American Bible Society, and the Global Bible Society, in changing the standard spellings in the King James Version. The new spellings are not only strictly American, they are incorrect substitutions. So if you have a Bible that spells music without the K at the end, you have an incorrect Bible. You see how this is you see how this argumentation about Matthew 5 and the jots and tittles is going this far. Okay? That paper that I released just this week is about this point. Okay? As early as 1792 Publishers of the King James Bible in America were already Americanizing the spellings of these words. Okay? Because they're publishing it not for a British audience, but for an American one. For an American audience. These are being made before the discovery of, of, of Sinaiticus manuscript by Tichendorf. These are, not, these are not the type of changes that are being made because people are trying to corrupt the text. They're trying to make the text readable to the people in America that are spelling the words what? Differently. Okay. Well, why does she allow for translation in other languages? She doesn't. The only one that's perfect is what? The only one that's perfect is the King James. That's the one God inspired. Uh, I, I, that doesn't matter because the only changes are these. I'm, I'm not joking. I have the books where she says that. Then how come spelling's wrong in the American? It does not, it's certainly not consistent, is it, Ronnie? <laughs> I'm going to skip D.A. Waite. In, two th in 2009, um, a guy named, a guy who called uh, Matthew um, Verscher, how do you say it? He's from Australia. He calls himself Bible Protector. He, that's the name of his ministry on the website. He wrote, Glistering Truths, Distinctions in Bible Words. Look at the title page. Distinct, glistening, glistering truths, distinctions in Bible words. Then the, in the fine print right there it says, and I gave it to you there, that every jot and tittle in our pure English Bible is necessary for giving the exact sense. So if that K is missing from music, can't convey the exact sense. Okay, look at some of the other quotes here. Number two there, he says, in fact, the King James Bible has been called the best translation in the world. If we look at this Bible, that is, at the proper edition of it, the pure Cambridge edition, we find that every word is right and good. So what has he just done? Now he has said you've got to have a pure Cambridge. Now you've 
you got to have a pure Cambridge edition because only the pure Cambridge edition sets all the jots and tittles exactly what? Exactly right. And, it's, and the pure Cambridge edition is a circa 1900 printing from Cambridge University Press. Oh, well, they changed a lot then, haven't they? Now you tell me what the problem is here. What were all those poor Christian, poor English-speaking Christians before 1900 to do without having Bibles that accurately gave the sense as portrayed in the pure Cambridge edition? And what about all of those after who didn't know they were supposed to look for a pure Cambridge edition? So all of you right now that don't have a pure Cambridge edition, you don't have the exact setting of the Bible that you should have. Okay. I gave it to my grandson. Well, at least it was for a good cause. Right. <laughs> Page eight. At least one will be saved. <laughs> Page eight. Let no man presume that he can improve upon our English Bible as it now stands, pure and perfect. No matter what the word, to alter it in any way is to violate the Scripture's teaching concerning its own certainty and perfection. Certainly the King James Bible has gone through the, purif has gone through the purified seven times process. That's a reference to Psalm 12, right? And remember we talked about Psalm 12, and I talked to you about the extreme use of that passage in King James only literature, remember that? That's that right there. Okay. I just have to say this. Could the... No, I better wait until I have it fully developed. I'm going to stop myself from saying something I'll regret. But this is not... Then he goes on to say, but this, but this is not licensed for further changes, updates, or alterations. So in other words, how many, how many different editions are there between 1611 and 1769? Guess how many? Seven. seven. So the seventh setting now is what? The perfect one. But it's not just perfect there. You've got to have it set this way. How Cambridge set it in 1900 to get that setting what? Perfect. If you're going to adopt what as your standard? Verbatim identicality. So let me, let me put this to you in practical terms. You are an American... Standing in, a book sh standing in a store in 1820 and you want to buy a Bible. Do you pick up your Bible, open it up to Daniel to see how the word music is spelled and say, oh, I just can't really buy that Bible. That's not the word of God. Music's not spelled right. So I'll wait 80 years. So. Well, you, need, you need to... Guys... I'm sorry, and I know some watching this believe these things and are going to be offended at me for saying some of this stuff, but that's ridiculous. What that is functionally doing is binding up the Word into one particular edition that unless I have that edition, I have a Bible that is incapable of giving me the Word of God exactly the way I should what? Okay. He says, rightness and exactness, rightness and exactness of words can be a matter of life and death. The very spelling of Bible words should be observed with fear of God. See, why is he saying that? Because he believes, or is at least implying, that God inspired these guys to what? To write it down to the very way they spelled what? The words. So let us be perfectly clear, changing so much as the word, order, spelling, or punctuation is destructive that a change as small as a minor point of punctuation is dire, if not obviously, at least puts in jeopardy the doctrine of reliability of its jots and what? So what verses are they using? What verse are they using to justify this type of thinking? Oh, and I'll, oh by the way, here's this is even better. I read both of these this week. He says it's the pure Cambridge edition. She says he's wrong because he's a Pentecostal. Sounds good to me. But that's what's going on here. But you see, if, if you don't read this stuff with sort of a sort of a historical bet and understanding, you're going to miss a lot of what's really going on here in this discussion. So we need to wrap this up because it's time to quit. 
So, the above list does not claim to be exhaustive of every use of Matthew 5, 17, and 18 by King James only advocates supporting the notion of plenary verbal preservation. Only indexed works were searched, and I did not read every line and every work ever written on the topic. That being said, I am confident that the above sampling is indicative of how Matthew 5, 17, and 18 is used by the majority of King James only advocates. So, Matthew 5, 17, and 18, these verses are clearly referring to the Old Testament scriptures originally given to the nation of Israel. Jewish scribes, when they were duplicating God's word, they went to incredible lengths to prevent error from creeping into the text. The whole process of copying the Bible was controlled by strict religious rituals and scribes carefully counted every line, word, syllable, and letter to ensure accuracy. The earliest surviving copies of the Hebrew Masoretic text, the text supporting the King James Old Testament, date from around the year 900 AD. Discovered in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls date from around 150 BC, roughly 1,000 years earlier. When compared with the Masoretic text for the book of Isaiah, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found to be word for word identical in over 95% of the text. The remaining 5% variation consisted of obvious slips of the pen and variations in what? Uh oh. Dr. Randall Price stated the following in his book on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He said, once a comparison was made between the text of the Isaiah scroll and the Masoretic text, it was evident that except for minor details such as what? Spelling, that did not affect the meaning of the text, the two were almost what? Identical. Identical. Even though the Qumran text is more than six centuries older than the text of the Masoretes, it confirmed the accuracy with which the scribes had carefully preserved and transmitted the biblical text through time. Do we have, with a high degree of accuracy, preservation? Yes. But do we have it with absolute, total, complete, verbatim identicality? Almost. Almost. Okay? So, this is historical confirmation of the biblical promise of preservation. Yet even with its high degree of precision, there is not exact identicality. The use of Matthew 5, 17 and 18 by King James only advocates demanding verbatim identicality or jot and tittle precision as the standard for preservation goes too far and demands more than can be historically proven. In the next lesson, we will look at the use of Matthew 5, 17 and 18 by those critical of the King James only position. All right, we are five minutes late again, so we are just going to have to quit. And I hope to see you back next week for lesson 45, where we will look at how non King James advocates use Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Did you see this comment this morning on your sheet? Yeah, I saw it.